Okay, hello, hello. My name is Karthik. I'll be with you this beautiful Saturday morning for Real Estate Practice Chapter 7. Want to take a moment and welcome you to the call today. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us. A couple of quick housekeeping things. If it is your first time here and you're a guest, just kind of checking out the class, do me a small favor and write the word guest in the chat. Doing so will let me know that there's at least one or two people on the call that don't yet have their book. So if you are a guest today, a hearty welcome to you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. It doesn't look like we have any guests today, so I will just jump right into Chapter 7. So Chapter 7 in real estate practice is really an extension of Chapters 4, 5, and 6. Chapter 4, we were talking about prospecting. Chapter 4, we were talking about finding a potential seller. Chapter 5 is about making a presentation to that seller. Chapter six was all about the contract that you'll sign with your seller. Chapter seven, this chapter is gonna be about servicing the listing. Great, so you have the listing signed. The question now is, well, you gotta to get to work. So servicing the listing. Now, if you look at page number 233, what you'll notice on page 233 is this discussion of owner agent communication. And this is a particularly important section because if you interviewed 10 people and all 10 said that they were unhappy with the agent that listed their property, the reason that they say that they're unhappy is not necessarily that the agent didn't sell the property. That's kind of secondary. The number one reason why sellers are unhappy with their agent on page 233 actually has nothing to do with the fact that they didn't get the house sold. Sellers complain that agents didn't communicate enough. Sellers complain that agents didn't communicate properly. So the number one reason why most sellers are unhappy with their agent has nothing to do with the fact that the house didn't sell. It has to do with the fact that the agent didn't communicate appropriately. And I want to show you one thing on 234 through 236 also. Because a gripe that agents have with their seller, kind of going the other way, a gripe that agents have with their seller is that sellers don't take enough pride in their property. Sellers don't pick up after themselves. Sellers maybe don't have the curb appeal that the top dollar that the seller really wants would mandate. So on 234 through 236, we have a little list here of homeowner hints for a successful sale. Things that a seller could do or could say that would help move the property. For example, what do you do if you go to a house to take a listing and the house is in shambles? There's clothes all over the floor. There's dishes, you know, a mile high in the kitchen sink. The bathrooms look like they haven't been scrubbed you know, in six months, how really, and in fact, I, this is probably worth unmuting the room for because we have a little bit of a small room. What do you do if the seller is not as clean as you would hope? Recommend they clean their house. Well, sure. You don't want to, well, if you tell a grown adult that you're looking to get paid from, that they are not clean and that they need to pick up after themselves, they're going to say, hey, I'm paying you a $40,000 commission, don't talk to me like I'm your 14-year-old son or daughter, is what they're going to say. So it's often not as simple as looking them in the eye and saying, clean up. I mean, you might do that with your younger sister or brother, but what do you tell a client? But I think that's the challenge, is in how do you say this to someone without seeming maybe condescending or seeming that you know, you're better than them. I mean, all these things that you're, is going to build a wall. Maybe you can start by saying, um, we want to really be able to allow the potential buyer to imagine themselves in the home. And so having it to be, you know, furnished, but um, kind of like a more of like a blank kind of canvas. So having minimal clutter or, you know, minimal distractions would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Again, there's no easy way to say this. I think you're both, well, you're all on the right track. It's just, how do you say this? To, and your broker is going to train you on all this. And it really is dependent. It's situational. It depends on 
how bad the property is. If the property is in complete shambles, seller's probably going to know, right? They'd have to be pretty tone deaf to not know that, hey, the, there's a hole in the ceiling. <laughs> Somebody's probably going to notice. So I think it depends on how how uh, how bad the property really is. John, were you going to add something, sir? I was just going to, I would try to get them to move based on money. If somebody's trying to sell a house, they want to sell it. Just tell them straight up. People are going to want to buy your house. It's it's potentially a quicker sale with less clutter, less junk. I wouldn't say junk, but uh, less, and like the other girl said, less imagination of, of trying to get around your dirty socks. You know, keep it clean. I could potentially sell it faster. Dirty socks. I thought my camera was off. <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, yeah. I mean, all your broker is going to train you on up all the train you up on all this, and it's not it's not easy when the seller wants top dollar, but is unwilling to do the things that would get them top dollar. So that's and then in fact, as you can probably imagine, that's a quite common scenario where someone wants more than it's worth but is not willing to actually do the things that are going to get them top dollar. So again, this is not easy. It does require some diplomacy on 234 through 236. You'll see a list of some of the recommendations that we can make to a seller to make sure that we, you know, get the property moved quickly. And by the way, if you look at page 236, you'll see this discussion about security. Now, this is becoming more of a concern it wasn't really a big deal as much, you know, 20 years ago. But these days, we are seeing things swipe from open houses. We are seeing things, you know, people coming to open houses and later coming back to rob the place. I mean, there is a little bit of that, a little bit more of that in 2023 than there was maybe in 2004 or 2003, for example. But if possible, we want to advise our seller on 236, remove expensive items from the property lock up any guns or other weapons, make sure that jewelry is put away. If you have even things like prescription medication, if they have like, you know, Vicodin or some other painkiller because they had a root canal or some dental procedure, they may have some of these, you know, painkillers in the medicine cabinet. We want to make sure that those are locked up and removed, mostly for the sanity of the seller, but also because as real estate brokers, we do not have insurance to cover the valuables of the seller. This would fall under the seller's homeowner insurance, but brokers do not maintain insurance to cover the seller's valuables. So we wanna definitely advise the seller to remove any items in the property, you know, before we start, before we actually start showing it. Now, 239, you'll see this discussion of staging on 239. And I'm guessing that you probably know what staging is, but what is staging? Probably heard this term before. What is this? Presenting your house to look a certain way. Excellent. That's perfect. It's a great example. It's a great definition, right? Um, setting up your house to look a certain way. Now, this could be as simple as the most basic form of staging really is where the seller just moves stuff around and declutters throw stuff away, put stuff in storage, just removes a bunch of stuff and maybe reconfigures the furniture to be um, a little more uh, friendly in terms of presenting the property, making sure the rooms look bright, airy and open, making sure there's not like big furniture blocking walkways. I mean, just decluttering and heavy cleaning. The most advanced type of staging is literally where you rent furniture. The whole you rent furniture for you know by the week, and a staging crew comes in, furnishes the whole property, puts up art, puts down rugs, puts up beds, puts up desks, puts up little fake TVs, and makes it look like a designer literally designed it. Now, so it can be as simple as hey, let's just declutter and move stuff around, or it could be as advanced as we're going to literally rent furniture and make it look like you never even lived here. Now, there is kind of a middle ground these days, especially from COVID. In 2020, virtual staging really became a thing. Virtual staging, as the name kind of implies, is where you take photos of the property on the inside, Photoshop out all the furniture, Photoshop in super high-end designer furniture, designer art, and you virtually stage it so that the photos for the MLS look like it's staged. Now, 
you have to disclose that the property is virtually staged. So that is a, that is a thing you have to say, Hey, this is virtually staged, but still, this is a nice, less expensive and sometimes even more effective stopgap for people that don't have the budget to actually pay for a full on staging. Now, the question of who pays for this, this depends. It could be the agent. It could be the seller. The agent and the seller could collaborate and split it, but it depends on how big the property is and how you know much commission the agent's uh, being paid. And so there's no rule. There's no law that says who has to pay for this, but obviously it's going to either be the seller, the agent, or some combination of the two. My question to you is, do you think staging actually works? Yes. yes. Probably so, probably, right? I mean, because what percentage of home buyers look at property online before they decide to spend their time and energy seeing it physically? All of them. Yeah, everybody, right? Everybody's going to say, hey, let me look at pictures first online and see if it's even something that I want to look at. So staging is not a waste of money. Staging definitely, definitely helps. So my point is, as the real estate market starts to change, you're not going to be able to just take your iPhone, have it in portrait mode, take four pictures and get 32 offers and all of them are over full price and all cash. Like that world is gone. That ship is sailed. So if we're talking about this chapter and servicing the listing, it's a heck of a lot more than a two sentence description in the MLS and a couple of photos on your iPhone. So we really have to make sure that we put our best foot forward because I'm not sure if you've seen interest rates lately. Right now, they're already at seven and an eighth. It takes less than one percentage point more to get it to eight. And the Fed's already announced they're going to raise rates one more time by the end of the year. I mean, if, if look, if inflation's at 8.2%, which is what the CPI is saying, and it's probably higher than that. If you're really trying to get inflation under control, rates have to be greater than inflation. You can't have rates less than inflation and expect inflation to come down because the money's still free, right? If the cost to borrow is still less than inflation, that you're really not doing anything. Now, that does a whole bunch of geopolitical issues that will happen if you raise rates that high. But the point simply is, is as it relates to staging and photography, we have to make sure that we are compelling buyers to look at our listing. We want to, and by the way, if you don't want to do any of that or your seller doesn't want to clean up or your seller doesn't want to stage or whatever, that's fine. But the price has to go up or down down, right? You can't, you can't want top dollar and set a record for the neighborhood and have a box truck in your backyard. So it, what, one of the two things has to happen. Either you're going to slash the price and leave it as is, or you're going to put the best foot forward. And that comes and staging is, is part of that. Now, let me ask you this. You already told me that the number one reason why sellers are unhappy with their agent is a lack of what? Communication. And communication, right? We know that already. The number one reason why sellers are unhappy with their agent is a lack of communication. Fine. If you look at 240, one way to kind of jump in front of that is this thing called a weekly activity report. So a weekly activity report is basically a report every week, as the name implies, not complicated, that basically is you as the real estate agent telling the seller what happened over the last week. How many showings did we have? How many ads did we run? How many inquiries did we have? How many Facebook ads did we run? How many Instagram inquiries did we get? Now, by the way, if you have no inquiries, no showings and no activity, and you're trying, meaning you're running ads, you're marketing properly, you have a great description, you have professional photos, the market is telling you, it's speaking to you that you need to drop the price. Because if you have no showings and no offers and no inquiries, but you have a great description and great photos, the price has to come down. So the weekly activity report basically is us trying to set the stage if we need a price reduction. Because I'll tell you what, if you take the listing and disappear for 60 days and don't communicate with the seller, and then 61 days later, you hit them up for a price reduction, they're going to say, hey, what were you doing? Where were you the last two months? So again, the weekly activity report is the way to avoid the number one reason why sellers are unhappy with their agent, which is a lack of what? Communication, right? A lack of communication. I want to do two more slides. I'll take any questions you might have. If you look at pages 241 and 242, you'll see the term neighborhood information request. 
on 241 and 242. And right next to this, you might want to write two words. I'd write the words competitive advantage. The neighborhood information request gives your listing a competitive advantage. Now, let me just quickly explain what I mean by that. This neighborhood information request is basically you as the agent of the seller asking the seller, why do you like the property? What about this home appealed to you when you bought it six years ago? Was it the fact that there are hiking trails nearby? Was it the fact that it's in a great school district? Was it the fact that there's a bunch of great nightlife and restaurants, you know, a quick five minute Uber right away? So what is it about this home that compelled you to buy it? And once I know that, this will help give me some ammunition to write in my descriptions, for my photo descriptions. It's going to give me a way to market the property to future buyers. Because again, when I understand what compelled you to buy it, this is going to help me tell the next person at an open house or in the MLS why they must also be compelled to write an offer on the property. So on 242, what's the school district? Where are the shopping and entertainment areas? Are there hiking trails nearby? Where are the best restaurants to eat? Where are the best bars to go to? So again, this knowing this is going to give your listing a competitive advantage. Now, one other thing we should talk about before I pause for any questions on 244 is this discussion about price reductions. Price reductions are obviously a very, very uncomfortable conversation to have with your seller. A lot of the time, the seller might have wanted a million one. You're recommending a price of 950. So you say, you know what? We'll try a million. So again, they wanted a million one when you took the listing. You really wanted 950. You said, fine, we'll try it at a million. Market changes, interest rates go up. It's been on the market for 40 days. You have one showing and no offers. Now, what do you do? Okay, you're going to ask the seller for a price reduction. Remember, the seller in their mind was probably anchored at a million one, right? They probably were like, hey, my house is worth a million one. I, my real estate agent twisted my arm to get it at a million. And now you're saying, look, the market's changed. I'm recommending a price of 925. And by the way, when the market slides, I'm not saying it's going to slide that quickly, that fast. I just don't know. But when the market slides, is it better to chase the market down or is it better to do one super painful price reduction and jump ahead of the sliding market? Jump ahead. You do not want to chase the market down with price reductions every 15 days. That's going to make you look desperate. Price the property properly from the beginning to avoid problems later. Now, you already probably know this, but the number one reason why a listing expires is not because it smells funny. It's not because it's in a bad location. It's not because it backs up to an active freight railroad track. None of those things help, but all of those things can be cured with the proper price. So the price is the thing that moves real estate. The motivation of the seller, the condition of the property, the location, all those are you know secondary to a good price. So the main reason a listing expires is because it was priced too high. You're going to want, if you're going to ask the seller for a price reduction, you must update your CMA. Question for you, if you had chapter five, do you remember what the CMA stands for? Competitive market analysis. Excellent. Yeah. Competitive or comparative market analysis. Same thing. Exactly. So it's basically a mini appraisal. If you're going to ask for a price reduction, do you think you need to show up at that seller's house with an updated CMA? Yes. Of course, of course, right? You're going to say, hey, well, you know, we kind of, we, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, unfortunately, we got it wrong. We, you wanted a million one. The market's changed. We tried it at a million. It's been on the market for 45 days. You know, based on my weekly activity report, that I've been doing X, Y, and Z in order to market the property. Unfortunately, that's not been sufficient. We probably need a price reduction to 949.9. Here's the data. The house that recently sold was a little nicer than yours, and it sold for 960. It had a pool. We don't. Here's the address. You can take a look at it. It's just two doors down. 
Here's the pictures. We can think we can agree it's been upgraded to a to a little bit of a higher standard than ours. By the way, when I I always like to say ours when I talk to the client, not yours, because when I say it's better, it's, it, it looks like it's a little nicer than ours. That makes it sound like we're on the same team. If I say it's a little nicer than yours. That sounds like we're completely disconnected. Like, hey, I'm in one boat and you're in another. Sucks to be you. So it's a little nicer than ours. I'm going to recommend that we reduce the price to $949. Now, again, if you've been communicating with the seller and you have hard comps and great data, this is going to be a little easier than if you took the listing back in September, you have never called them once. And all of a sudden you show up 42 days later and you're like, hey, I think we need to drop the price. They're going to say, hey, what the heck have you been doing for the last 45 days? So again, over-communicating is especially important. So again, we want to avoid an expired listing. What causes a listing to expire? It's not the condition. It's the fact that it's priced too high, for one. We want to make sure that we're regularly in communication with the seller so that if we do, heaven forbid, need to ask for a price reduction, we are able to do it. Now, by the way, last year... If you remember mid 2021, how many properties do you think needed the price to be dropped? Not many. None, exactly. Yeah. Not many. Interest rates were at 3% or maybe even lower. There was super shortage of inventory. I mean, the world was a literally a different place last year, at least the real estate market than today. Today, interest rates are more than two times what they were this time last year. They're probably going to continue to increase. You need to have, you can't just be a, you know, an unsophisticated real estate agent and just pick a price and think it's going to sell, right? This next two or three years is where people are going to get really rich because a lot of the real estate agents that were pretending and a lot of the house flippers that were pretending, they, those guys and gals are going to get swept away with the tide. The next two or three years is if you really are committed to your craft and you care, the next few years is going to be where more real estate agents are probably going to get out of the industry. Newer agents, it's going to be easier because not anybody can sell a property as, as the market starts to change. So these next few years are going to be quite telling for folks that, and I say this with 21 years of doing this and having done 2008, 9, and 10 and never getting out of the industry, never stopping, I just have some context as to probably what's going to happen over the next few years. So it's a great entry point for new agents getting in because you are going to have some level you're going to have to have some level of skill because just inputting it in the MLS and getting 30 offers kind of isn't going to be how the world works over the next little bit here. Now, on 244 it says what if the seller refuses to reduce the price? Now, the book is going to say the book is going to say give the listing back. If the seller refuses to reduce the price on 244, they're going to say, "Hey, you know, consider giving the listing back." And you'll You'll see this kind of at the bottom half or the middle, it's probably in the middle of 244. It says, if owners refuse to adjust their price, you may consider giving the listing back. And that's not, you know, that's completely contextual. That's not the right strategy in every situation, but it, it is not the worst advice in the world if the seller is completely in left field. Uh, but again, the agent has some responsibility there too, because how could you let it get that bad? It's better to not take the listing overpriced from the beginning instead of taking the listing overpriced and hoping that you can beat the crap out of the seller every week for the next, you know, two months to get a price reduction. So, you know, the best strategy is to just price the property properly from the beginning in order to avoid these super awkward conversations. But by the way, if you're a real estate agent that's just looking at Zillow or you're a real estate agent that's looking at comps from six months ago, those comps from six months ago literally don't matter. Because whoever was buying the property probably got a loan and their payment is reflective of an interest rate at, you know, three and a half or 4% six months ago, not seven and a half percent or, you know, seven and an eighth. Or, now, jumbo's better. It, the banks, jumbo loans with banks are still under 6%, but because their cost of funds is very low. They're basically portfolio loans, but still rates are a hell of a lot higher now than they were last year. So if you're looking at comps from a year ago, those are trash, right? Those comps. Those comps don't matter. Now, before we get into your marketing plan, I do want to just pause here for a second. Um, questions about anything here? Okay, well, I want to respect your time and keep it moving on a Saturday. So let me show you uh, 
on 245, really clear through to 259, your marketing plan. So most of the time, as a newer agent, you're probably going to be working with buyers more than you are working with sellers. Buyers generally are easier clients to get. Buyers ultimately care about, hey, am I going to get that property? This real estate agent just happens to be in the way. So buyer clients are easier to pick up because they just want to see a house. They want to get in and they want to you know, get a halfway decent deal. Sellers are going to ask agents more uncomfortable questions. How many properties have you sold? How long have you been in the business? You know, what, what's your marketing plan going to be to get me top dollar? You know, how do I know that you're the right person for the job? All those questions that buyer clients don't really ask as much. So clearly, if you look at the, the slide here, of course, we're probably going to put up a for sale sign. You know, something like 8% of homes are still sold or still sold because someone saw a sign. Professional photos. We talked about how important it is to get professional photos. I'll show you one deal that I did last summer. Let me, I'll share something with you here. Uh, this is a, let's see, I got Zillow, let me see. Yeah, this was, this was back in May. Check, check this house out here. So this was a deal I did, just a local deal. I got it referred. It was an easy deal. So I was like, fine, I'll take it. This property sold, look at these photos. I mean, my photographer did a killer job. Um, this is quite common, right? Adding the twilight in the back, lighting all the windows on the inside. This is kind of a common post-production thing that a lot of photographers do. But again, this is a small deal, little referral from a, from a lender of, uh, that I know. This property, I am convinced, because I listed this thing at 429.9. Look what it sold for, 491. And I am, at, and this is like five months ago. Um, I am absolutely, that's me there. Um, I am absolutely convinced that the photos are what made this thing sell for, you know, 60, 70,000 over full price. And I mean, I think having light, bright, airy photos, uh, make, ha making sure that small stuff like the uh, blinds are up so you have a lot of natural light. Um, stuff like this cord, my photographer made sure that it was like not dangling and looking, just small things, right? That I think make the property look as best as possible. We don't want to be deceiving in the photos, but we still want to make sure that the property is presented properly online. We're going to want to put a lockbox on the property if you can help it. Lockboxes control access and they're actually quite safe. The lockboxes that real estate agents use today really are a function of um, a decent amount of technology. They have times that you can set that they won't open at two in the morning. So if your seller is worried that, hey, some psycho real estate agent is going to open my door at 2 a.m., you can set them to only work at certain times. Anybody that accesses it, we're going to have their first name, last name, real estate license number, the company they work for. We're going to be able to see all that right when they uh, right when they access the box. I can get a notification or alert on my phone alerting me that someone's accessed the box. What's also interesting about lockboxes is that you definitely don't want... So sometimes what some people will do innocently, but it's really bad, is that like, say you're at a property showing and you use your lockbox and enter, right? Use your key and enter. Now your access has been logged. So it shows that Betty Smith accessed that box at 1040 on Saturday. If another realtor comes behind you and says, oh, I'm here to show, and you just hand them the key innocently, right? Because you're like, oh, I was going to put this back in the lockbox, but let me just give it to you. If you just hand that agent the key and don't have them access it, obviously you can see what the problem is going to be. If something comes up stolen that day, the listing agent's going to run a report on the box and it's never going to show that next realtor having accessed it because you just handed them the key. So it's super important to make sure that I don't care how nice that person looks. I don't care if they have a, a, a million dollar smile and you're, they're trustworthy, or even if it's somebody that you kind of know, Oh, Hey, what's up, man? I, you know, we did a deal together last month. Cool. Here's the key. You definitely don't want to hand it to them because if their client steals something from the house, if they don't touch the lockbox and use their own access point, it's never going to log or register that they actually um, entered the home. So just a quick thing. Uh, I know when you're out there showing property, it's really easy to kind of get distracted and you're running late to your next one. 
but lock lock it up, put the lockbox back in the box, and you know let the next person access it themselves. Um, you're going to want to create a flyer on page 248. For some reason, I don't know why, but our exam calls this a property brief. Uh, a property brief is basically a flyer on the property or a brochure. You're going to want to create a brochure that's easily emailed um, in case you get a, a phone inquiry or somebody, you have a text inquiry from someone. It's cool to kind of shoot them a two or three page little flyer or brochure on the property. So you're going to want to have uh, a, at least a halfway decent marketing plan. You're going to want to have uh, home tours, maybe even a Matterport tour. Maybe you've heard of, has anybody heard of a Matterport camera? And just so you know what I'm, I'm, how, that I'm, how I'm pronouncing and I'm putting it in the chat. Has anybody heard of this camera before? So this camera basically, yes. yeah, it creates, uh, so let me show you what, what a Matterport tour looks like. A Matterport tour is basically like a dollhouse virtual tour of the property. So I'll just share my screen here real quick and you can see kind of what it's like. And it's a really cool marketing tool. So basically you get this image um, of the home, number one. And number two, you can use your mouse or you can use your like um, up down arrows or you can swipe on your phone and it'll literally look like you were walking through the property. It'll feel a little bit like you're, it's not totally immersive, but it's still cool. You can like walk through a hallway, walk into a bathroom, turn around. There's a bunch of cool stuff that you can do when you're in the tour. So the, these Matterport tours got, they've been around for a while. But as you can imagine, they got super popular during COVID when people still wanted to buy and sell real estate, but they like didn't feel comfortable entering a home, you know, in the early stages of, of the coronavirus. So this really got traction um, probably about 2020, you know, mid-2020 when no one, no one could view a piece of real estate. So um, by the way, these tours will cost you a few hundred dollars, but totally worth it. And by the way, it's at least a talking point for a seller. It's a way that you can tell a seller when they say, hey, what are you going to do? Hey, I'm going to spend some money, right? I'm going to get a professional photographer. I'm going to get a videographer. I'm going to get a Matterport 3D tour done for your property. Um, you know, it at least justifies your commission. Because how often do you think a seller might try to squeeze you on the commission? I don't know, at least half the time, right? At least they're going to try to negotiate it. Being able to tell them what you do and how you spend your money is going to help justify the you know four five six percent commission that you're charging. Um, any thoughts about Matterport at all or virtual tours? By the way, if you're interested, I wrote an article um, about Matterport kind of in the middle of COVID. Um, I'll paste a paste that in the group chat if you want to read that. That's kind of a breakdown of the camera, its history, how it works, all that sort of thing. So, um, and it really is. Uh, it really is the future of, of, of virtual tours for sure. A um, couple of last things here. If you look at 255 through 256, part of your marketing plan also should probably be doing an open house. Now, one of the worst kept secrets in the real estate industry is why real estate agents do open houses. Why does a real estate agent do open houses? Let's be honest. Get new clients. Exactly. Real estate agents do open houses not to sell that property that day. Very few real estate agents wake up in the morning, go to an open house, and they think to themselves, man, I'm going to sell that house today. That's kind of not a thing. Real estate agents, as John rightly said, I wake up, do an open house thinking, how many new buyer clients am I going to pick up today? How many new seller clients am I going to pick up today? So open houses are not to sell that house that day. Open houses are to find other clients for other property. Now, what makes a successful open house? Probably traffic, right? As much traffic as possible through the open house. How do we drive traffic? Well, we want to advertise the open house on Zillow, advertise the open house on the MLS, uh, have a bunch of signs up. You're probably going to get five to 25 people that will walk in your open house. Now, by the way, if I was a newer real estate agent just starting out, I would probably do open house every Saturday and every Sunday for the first year of my career. Why? For a bunch of reasons. Number one, what does it cost to do an open house? 
time. Just time, not money, right? I'm not asking you to buy anything. I'm not asking you to subscribe to some nonsense. I'm not asking you to pay anything. It's just your time. And I've said this before, as a newer real estate agent, do we probably have more money or time? Lots of time. Lots of time, exactly, right? So we want to spend the resource that's most abundant. So you're going to meet five to 25 people probably in an average open house. You're going to get most of them to sign in. You're not going to fight with someone. You know, some real estate agents are like, man, if you don't want to sign in, you can leave. It's like, dude, whatever, right? Just fine. You don't want to sign in. You want to put Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or, you know, Cinderella on the sign-in sheet. Cool. You knock yourself out. But for the people that do give us proper information, and by the way, all of us have probably been to an open house. And I, I think if you look back at your experience at open houses, you probably have one of two experiences. One experience is you have a super friendly, awesome, welcoming real estate professional that like wants to answer your questions and gives you a little bit of space to roam and, you know, just is there, but not overbearing, but is a good agent. Then you have some real estate agents that are down on their phone, scrolling through Instagram or TikTok. And they're like, Hey, if you have any questions, let me know. And they just like ignore you. There's kind of no middle ground. Either you have somebody that's like really on their game or you have somebody that's completely disconnected. And if you're disconnected, you may as well stay home, right? Cause you're not doing anything just sitting at the open house. But that sign-in sheet, the three, four, five, eight, 10, 20 names you have on your sign-in sheet, I think we would all agree that we should be doing something with that sign-in sheet. What that something is, I'm not sure, but we should be doing something, You're putting them into a database, calling them, texting them, following up, whatever, right? You should be doing something. My question to you is, if you agree that you should follow up with that sign-in sheet, my advice to you is to call that sign-in sheet that day. If your open house is on Saturday, don't wait till Sunday or Monday to call. I would call. So if my open house is from one to four, at four o'clock as my open house is ending, I'll lock the door, go grab all my open house signs. I'll come back to the property. I'll leave a note for the seller because our instructions to the seller that day were, you know, please kind of scoot away for a few hours while we do the open house. So the house should be empty still. I'd leave a note for the seller, just a quick handwritten note on a three by five card. Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, thank you so much for, you know, going to see a movie for a few hours. Appreciate it. Uh, we had 12 people come through the open house. I'm going to follow up very aggressively on those 12. I'll let you know what happens. Thanks so much, Fred, the realtor. Now, before I leave, I'm going to call those 12 people on that open house list while I'm still in the home. Ring, ring. Hello. Hi, this is so-and-so with XYZ Real Estate. Hey, we just met like 45 minutes ago at that property on Banana Street. I'm leaving a little note for the owner. I just wondered what you thought of the property. Just so I could give the owner some feedback, what did you think of the home? Now, let me ask you this. Do people like to tell you what they think? People love giving their opinion. <laughs> Everyone loves to tell you their opinion on whatever. So, oh, you know, I thought it was great. I thought it was a little overpriced, though. The pool was kind of dirty. You know, I was disappointed to see the pool wasn't as clean as it could have been. Great. You know, just out of curiosity, how soon are you thinking about buying a property? Do you need to sell a house first before you buy your next one? Have you met with a lender? Are you working with an agent, right? All these questions you could ask. The key is to follow up that day. Why? Because if you do the open house on Sunday and you wait until Monday morning to call those leads, I don't know about you, but I'm way more likely to pick up a phone call from a number that's local, but I don't recognize on like a Sunday at 5.15 in the afternoon than I am on a Monday morning at nine. Because on a Monday morning at nine, I'm doing other things, right? I'm working, I'm doing whatever. It's probably a telemarketer. It's some weird number I'm not going to pick up. But Sunday at five, not so many people's phones ring from telemarketers on Sunday in the afternoon. Or you shoot them a text um, if they've agreed to opt in on the text on your little sign-in sheet there. But my point simply is, is a lot of real estate agents, the tragedy is that they'll do an open house. They'll be away from their family. They'll spend the time and energy and gas going out there. And they never follow up on the sign-in sheet. What the hell is the point of doing an open house to try to collect people's information if you ultimately don't want to do anything with the information that you now have? So again, my recommendation on 255 and 256 is do an open house, hopefully, every single weekend for your whole first year in the business. It's like a little mini pop-up for real estate. And when you get that sign-in sheet, don't take it for granted those are great leads. I mean, 
people pay companies like Zillow and homes.com thousands of dollars a month to obtain leads. You just picked up half a dozen for free. You may as well, you may as well follow up on that sign-in sheet. So again, just a review of the chapter, then we'll do the quiz. The number one reason why sellers are unhappy with their agent is a lack of what? Communication. The way we alleviate that is the uh, weekly activity report. That's super important. We want to use the seller's information as a competitive advantage for us. So we know why they bought the house. This will hopefully help us understand why the next person might buy it. Have a marketing plan written down. What are you going to do to sell the property? These have a few talking points. We know about Matterport and virtual tours. I do want to do the quiz 